I'd also like to thank our ARA webinar series sponsor, Frausher. Uh, their generous support uh, helps us continue delivering these webinars and we uh, graciously, greatly appreciate their involvement. So we have a, a great webinar for you this week titled The Future of Stations. Today, Malcolm Smith, the Australasian Cities Leader for Arab, will be sharing uh, with us themes and concepts that will shape the design, operation and experience of new and existing as, uh, station assets into the future. There will be some time for Q&A after Malcolm's presentation, so as always, please post your questions at any time via the questions pane in your control, uh, attendee control panel, which should be sitting there to the right of your screen. So without any further ado, let me formally introduce today's speaker. As I mentioned, Malcolm Smith is the Australasian Cities Leader for Arab, based here in their Melbourne office. Um, before taking up this role, he was the founding director of the Integrated Urbanism Unit at Arab in London in 2002, uh, specialising in complex master planning projects with sustainable outcomes. As the Arab Fellow in Master Planning and Urban Design, Malcolm guides the design strategy for Arab's master planning projects across the world. And besides the physical issues of places, his work encompasses issues such as integrated systems, resource efficiency, cultural strategy, meaningful infrastructure, risk and resilience, and social value. So thanks very much for joining us today, Malcolm, and I'll hand over to you now to run us through your presentation. Simon, thank you very much, and uh, I'm delighted to be here um, individually and on behalf of my Arab colleagues. Um, Look, today, you know, is a little bit of a kind of a, you know, suspend, suspend the present and imagine the future. And I guess as, a, as, a, as someone who is involved in city scale projects, that's what we always try to do. We almost have to do. You know, we are designing into a future and our, and our railway infrastructures and our stations both need to kind of, you know, imagine that future that they're going to work into married with the realities and the challenges and the complexity of, of, of what is in front of us every day as we make these critical pieces of our, our physical and our social infrastructure. Where do we come to when we, we from future of stations? Well, a little part of um, Arup is we have an Arup University and we have a foresight team that helps us kind of imagine these, these futures. And so the future of stations is a piece of work that we've been doing around the railway businesses around the world. Um, and a key contributor is Anna Squires, who is the, the Australasian rail leader based in Sydney office. And so thinking and asking ourselves a series of questions, almost more than kind of conclusions about what is the future of stations. And I thought that, you know, the interesting part to kind of start with is this interesting quote <laughs> that we found from Goth, where, where he says, one does not one does not travel to arrive, but to journey. And I, we reflected on that a little bit and we thought, well, what journey? You know, when are we journeying? Who is journeying? You know, and I think if anything, kind of COVID has kind of fundamentally shown that the way in which we use all our infrastructures, let alone the kind of our rail and our station networks, is changing, has changed dramatically. We use it at different times of the day. We are changing the, you know, the, the access of populations. We will, I think, continue to see a different intensity of uses, distribution of people using it, expectations of how to use it. And so it is a, it's possibly a good time once it's kind of seen this disruption of COVID to ask what is the future of the station. So I, I wanted to guide us through three things today. Some of the future thoughts that we've developed in our Future of Stations booklet. But I wanted to share with you two other things from different viewpoints. One is from an operator and one is from someone who provides rolling stock. You know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the assets that roll in and out of our, our stations and see whether these three things pull together some interesting considerations for us all to discuss. But that notion of what is a journey and who and what and when really raised the question of how do we get this kind of breadth of analysis of what we're looking at. And so, you know, we, we, ha we have a kind of a tested process of using effectively a steep, you know, social, technical, economic environment and political framework to begin to test the breadth of issues that could, you know, be asked of a station of the future. You know, some of the technical issues of the way in which we are integrating our 
our digital systems, whether that's you know the, the way in which a station operates or the way in which users interface. Economic issues of ownership, control, relationship to business cases, you know, long-term viability, environment, the issues of you know how we are interfacing it, challenges of carbon and 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 emissions that are coming, and air quality that are coming over the horizon, political, you know, the ability to to understand how these things are kind of funded across sectors and the like, or some of the increasingly social expectations. And I think the social is a particularly relevant thing that we found. So look, let's let's jump through some of this and see see whether there's some some pictures that we can start to see. There were six principles that began to kind of percolate to the top as we started to look through the steep framework. And so they set the framework for the way in which we looked at the stations of the future. The first one, there seemed to be this increasing notion of porosity in the boundary of what was the station. You know, there has to be obviously kind of legal asset controls and safety and security and thresholds that are done. But certainly, you know, the digital infrastructure was beginning to kind of deconstruct that boundary and make it much more porous, certainly from a user point of view. And we'll say, I'll say a little bit more about that later. You know, the notion of when one is entering and exiting, you know, the, the, the traditional station edge is becoming certainly much, you know, much more uh, porous and agile. Look, I think the second thing that we're starting to see is just that kind of increased diversity beyond the core and fundamental, and I would say consistent need of trans of, of station as a, as a mode of transport. You know, the way in which they operate over increasingly, you know, as we work longer, as we increase our leisure time, the way in which we experience life and engage, meant that this diversity demand was increasing, you know, in the image of, of the King's Cross um, ticket hall is, is a clear example of that. But I think it's going even further. What is its kind of contribution, the station of kind of connectivity and accessibility to this beyond just a transport need? Um, I'm just going to try and, there we go, click through. So um, we often talk about an integrated system. You know, modes should be integrated, you know, but not just accommodated. I think sometimes we kind of, uh, and, and, and you know, the, the process of bringing this together drives this. You know, modes are placed next to each other. Increasingly, we are seeing them, you know, in a much more fundamentally integrated way. And it's not just the physicality of this integration that we're starting to see. The way in which different operators, you know, are, are much more seamlessly working together to create that journey that asks the question at the beginning, that seamlessness is becoming much more paramount that it produces some significant challenges in the way in which you struck those and deliver those into reality. Um, I guess there is a question of the who question. Who are the who are the users and the experiences as the outcome? It was very interesting doing some work in in um, in Japan and Germany, where we're seeing a kind of an increasing aging of our communities. How do we begin to understand the excellence of experience across this broadening you know range of not only age but you know varying ways of interfacing with the station environment um, we'll see a little bit further on the way in which that might begin to give us some clues on usage um, the adaptability I think was 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 a theme that we certainly heard from you know in the, in, in an Asian context of the station environments. Um, that there has to be a kind of increased ability to to quickly adapt. I think no one preempted, you know, the, the need to be able to kind of adapt as quickly as we did or respond in the COVID context. But it does highlight that maybe we have to have a kind of a model of testing scenarios in the way in which these the, the station environments, whatever that station is in terms of its threshold, should be more adaptable. And so we were starting to hear these principles come through time and time again. Um, and then what the, the benefits of how, how we understand benefit and value. Now, we, we, I think we were hearing this often in the, in the political context of those that we were consulting as we were looking into the future of a station. You know, the significant investments that go, whether it's an economic investment or a political investment, 
requires us, I think, to be able to demonstrate that the, the value outcomes aren't just just the core economic. And so we have to start seeing not only social outcomes, but the environmental and, and, and broader benefits that are happening. And I think we need to be able to articulate that in a variety of currencies that allow people to understand the intersection of the way in which these values are brought by the station and its kind of supporting rail system. So what would the station of the future look like? Well, you know, it would have been easy to kind of imagine, you know, flying drones and all of this type of stuff. We know that cities don't change that quickly and our infrastructure doesn't. And certainly in a station environment, we didn't want to kind of pretend that this was some, you know, futuristic thing. But there were things and clues on some projects that were coming through that we thought would be nice to record. So the first thing that we, we started to see was, you know, when there is a prioritization of, of a human-centered design approach, how do we understand it? How, how, can, how, how do people use it? How do different people use it? And how does that begin to affect the form of the station environment that we make? The quality of light, the presence of, 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 of kind of, you know, waiting environments, the relationship to green space, those very human-based conditions and the way we did it. We thought we saw an interesting, uh, you know, step change in the Arnhem Central Station. And, uh, and if you understand the, the station, it kind of begins to move from the motion diagram of people. You know, the ability to, to move on levels, to, to look over the gathering spaces, to orientate yourselves, to kind of almost meander, as well as participate in the process of journeying. And so the Arnhem Station, we thought, was, was, was an interesting clue of one part of the future. Um, Using a digital experience. Well, I, I, I think, you know, the one thing that we know about, you know, working in cities and station environments of digital is that what we're doing today is different tomorrow. You know, we are on the cusp of kind of, you know, having a, 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 a dominantly satellite based digital infrastructure. So information and digital accessibility will be everywhere. What does that mean when we're in a station environment? And I guess what we started to see were a few things that um, we, we, we tried to find where this was happening at the greatest scale and the greatest speed. And we found in Shanghai, you know, that the adoption of all the, the 5G network in the context of the station was, was beyond anything else that we could see. Now, what did that mean? What that meant was that the use of the, of the network and the digital enablement was people were beginning to kind of, you know, camouflage that edge of the station before we we thought they were, you know, they were they were cementing the journeys together. They were reconstructing reconstructing the way in which what was the station and what was the journey, and so digital is beginning to kind of do that that kind of seamlessness of of creating the station of the future. And therefore, us, where does the station start? We began to think about um, what are the uses that people uh, need or could or desire to have in and around the station environments. You know, there is this competition for space. And I think there was a competition for um, convenience of uses and facilities that are associated with the station. You know, the asset of the station is, is, a, is, is, is characterized by accessibility, by convenience and, and, and a kind of a choice of when one moves and not. Those assets are very equally attractive to many other things, whether they are cultural facility, housing facilities. We often talk about it in the context of the precinct, and we'll, I'll say a little bit more about that. But we do think there is an opportunity to kind of allow the station, the experience of the station environment to be much more informed by this diversity of use types that's coming through. And so we began to see these uses coming through in, um, in, in an interesting way, you know, just down the road from, from, from where I lived in London. And this was the Canary Wharf Crossrail Station. And if you know that, it, it is kind of a, a, a long station with, a, with a, effectively a park at the top where the character of the place of dwelling is seamlessly integrated in a very vertical way from the station area of the train environment at the lower levels through retail access to the wider context 
to a landscape on the top. And so we start to kind of see this, this blurring of activity. And I therefore think user and attractiveness of what is the station of the future. And so we started to see that certainly coming through in what we saw in Canary Wharf. Um, seamlessly integrating mode and service, you know, we, we, we saw it coming through in the principles and we think it's a kind of critical thing that's coming through. It's easy to say that. I think we saw certainly the most mature deployment of that in some of the integrated service offers in Germany, um, the ability or even in, in the likes of Singapore, where the, the, the recognition of different modalities are kind of joined together in a, in a one service offering. I we wanted to throw a, a slightly different, you know, take on this, on this kind of seamlessness. And that is the way in which the, the, the kind of the curtain, the, the skirt of the physical station is beginning to kind of, we think increasingly integrate itself into the surrounding areas. You know, the, the, the reducing of as certainly autonomous vehicles and controllable environments on the edge begin to mesh the city into the, into the context of the station. And I think that creates interesting opportunities for where people dwell, the scale of halls, that these aren't necessarily, necessarily within the threshold of the station. And so this notion of kind of, you know, the seamlessness and the connection to the surrounding is something. We saw this, you know, some interesting notions of flexi curve and, you know, the way in which the, the road is no longer the road, but it is a kind of a, a territory that, it, that complements the station environments. Um, the catalyst for sustainability, you know, we saw it coming through in the principles and we think it's even critical. You know, these are, these are significant challenges that are broadening themselves out. We've seen, you know, some structural announcements, you know, from the Australian government and, and, and various of the state governments on aspirations for decarbonisation of the role of emissions, of the role of health and wellbeing, of the role of kind of environment and quality coming forward at a rapid pace. And I think stations, you know, have almost the, 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 the requirement to address this, but also the opportunity to kind of lead the discussions in the way in which this infrastructure contributes to it. We saw a very interesting example um, in, in some of the work in New York. You know, interesting as a result of, of the Sandy hurricane in 2012, the Transit Authority begins to look at the way in which it increases its resilience of, of the station environments to future flooding. Um, seeing the storm up in Queensland, you know, the other day, it was interesting, you know, this project came to mind. Are we fully afraid with not only kind of the opportunities of sustainability, but the requirements of resilience in relation to our, some of the environmental challenges that will come? And so the New York example was something that, that we found really interesting to, to kind of test and ask the question. We think there are some issues around this as well in terms of increasing heat, particularly in our CBD environments, the role of kind of climate mitigation, whether it's in the approach to the station or the kind of the heat storage inside the station environments that will need to be addressed in a similar way. And so, but the New York example we felt was a nice one. Um, urban regeneration and, and the mobility, the social mobility that sits around a station. Um, you know, this asks some challenging questions of, who can and does have access to the use of, of you know, that, 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 that quality and that fundamental, you know, importance of being able to move around place. And so the notion of social mobility, affordability, you know, some very interesting discussions on the way in which we historically price um, movements of environments in a concentric model to the city when increasingly we don't move like that, we move around places in a different way. And so the station in one way becomes a, a, a kind of a, a, a core of this notion of, of its social mobility. Um, we saw this in a, in a, in a different way in the, in the Birmingham example in the UK, where the integration, almost the kind of the, the, the disappearance of the station in my into the Grand Central and, and the gathering environment, you know, in that delightfully wet, in, you know, for those who know Birmingham context of, 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 of the UK, creates this great gathering space and is socially accessible, facilitated by building over the station and, you know, bring, bringing a, a place of people of social accessibility into the part of the contribution that the physical station made. 
So, so look, the vision of a future of the station could be many things. And so I wanted to kind of quickly, you know, we tried to do a drawing where we all, it's almost kind of, you know, where's Willie, if you know that kind of child's game where the little character is in, where is the station? And I think that is a notion that the station is increasingly a kind of a camouflaged entity. You know, we had a history of, of great halls and, you know, often produced because of the technology of steam and the like. I think our stations are changing a little bit into there and being, being integrated and camouflaged into their environments. There were six or so things that we thought, you know, we needed to make sure were at the forefront of our minds. The notion of vanishing boundaries, we've spoken about that, whether those boundaries are the edge, the boundaries of the platform thresholds, the boundaries of information, of time, of interconnectivity, the way in which these, these boundaries vanish relative to the user that obviously are still in place by those who kind of make up the ecosystem of the experience of journeying and the passage through a station. Um, Real-time demand, um, you know, the expectation that if I can, you know, get everything else in real time, am I getting the experience of the station and the movement systems in equal real time? I think we're moving well towards this and people are starting to understand how to deliver that. But I think we're equally understanding that, that, that it's still in some areas slightly fragmented in the ability of, of this information and the expectation. And, and you know, retreating back to that notion of the, the human experience, the customer experience of being able to kind of understand and make choice with the information of real time, you know, demand, I think is a critical thing for the future experience and outcome of the station. Accommodating different uses and users. Um, we, I think we, we still recognize that there is a kind of a, you know, the middle of the bell curve often of, of, of types of accessibility that we do. It was interesting, we, we, as we were embarking on this, we were equally doing some research on the role of children in cities. And we're currently working with some very interesting entities, including the likes of Lego, on what is the notion of a child as they experience a city? Imagine what it's like to see it from 1.2 meters a station environment as we increasingly diversify the uses. So accommodating different uses and users. And I think we have to set ourselves the challenges of, of how we do that. I, I guess I wanted to kind of, you know, almost bring this bring this to, an, to, to a kind of a conclusion of the role of active design. You know, active design being about a, a much greater kind of integration of the, the, the components of life. That, as it says, it's not about the station as a kind of a destination always. It's, a, it's about this piece along the journey. And as we see in the Crossrail station in London with its garden on the top, as we see increasingly, certainly in some of the Dutch stations, you know, the integration of activities, of sporting events, of kind of cultural events that are kind of knitting themselves together, that active design and the station experience is complementary to the other experiences and choices of life that can be facilitated around the physical station. If only we could know, you know, with certainty, what the next five, 10 or 15 years do. I think what we, the, the, the value of a station is there is the fixed infrastructure of the rail and the operational systems that go with it. Some of the spaces that kind of wrap around it, we think, it, uh, you know, can have an agility towards them can have an adaptability, but it needs careful consideration of some of the, you know, technical constraints, whether it's fire, security, movement systems, that, that allow these spaces to evolve over time. If we can get that agility into some of the complementary spaces around this, you know, that, 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 that sit in concert with the core station environments, we think that that, that gives us a kind of a, a vision of the future of some of the way in which the station is experienced and it's, and it's taken forward. It's, we don't believe that, you know, digital is the be all and end all. You know, I think we've seen a return to the, to the importance of, of this kind of integrated system between digital systems and, and the human touch and the human experience. You know, and it takes us to the role of the station and the movement as a service and, and, and looking at other industries and other sectors that begin to increasingly understand the opportunities and the experience that is made 
by drawing together the kind of the empowerment of the individual in a digital and then the relationship to to the kind of the the human support that goes around that i don't think we fully understand that as we continue to transact between digital and human but i think it's certainly something that's drawing through and finally, you know, seamless modes of transfers. You know, I think we've said this before and we see this certainly in areas of whether it's a whether it's those who are who who are moving in different ways, wheelchair and 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 and, and able-bodied and disabled bodied, you know, commuters and, and participants and actors, or whether it's the systems that we use and the accommodation on the infrastructure and the way in which we can do that. And that influences the station experience for all of those who are using it if these are in, in a core consideration. So how do we begin to increase the things? It's interesting in the Netherlands, you would think that it would be the challenges of the bicycles, but there is a kind of structural shift towards scooters and the way in which they are being accommodated on their on the rail systems. In, and I think, you know, seeing the way in which the, the product of, of, the, of the train sets as well as the physical of the environment can be seamless is a critical thing. And we'll see a little bit of that, you know, in the examples that I did. So look, that was future thoughts. That was us kind of imagining, you know, trying to kind of set a range of challenges and issues. But what happens at the other end? What happens when it's when the rubber really hits the road of being an operator or providing some of that rolling stock? Let me share with you very quickly those two points of views. We were asked by Network Rail, the operator in the UK, to imagine tomorrow's living station, roughly in concert with, with the development of the future stations study that I've just outlined. And the challenge was to us to kind of provoke a, a, an internal discussion to Network Rail and beyond of what we should be thinking about. And I think it started very clearly from, from being able to say, have we captured the breadth of actors and users and participants that operate inside the realm. So, you know, the, the notion of starting with people focus and, and, and being able to kind of articulate need, desire, anxiety and risk in a very human focused way was critical to the message that Network Rail wanted to develop. There were three things that came up. Firstly, and I think very importantly, station is the centre of movement of people. You know, this is its this is its DNA. This is its essence. You know, and, and and one cannot forget that and get you know distracted from this as you know, you know, going away and coming back safely, clearly, efficiently is at the is it at the heart of it. There were two or three thoughts that we had, and you know, we certainly talked about you know personalized movement in this in this system of moving. We talked about you know more choices and and the interchange, but it was certainly about the notion of partnership and collaboration for what is that journey? How are we bringing together those with mutual interest and benefit for this, you know, you know, door to door journey experience that came through? The second one was a bit different. The second one where Network Rail kind of said was we, you know, build it and they will come or, you know, build it in response to demand. And in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of higher level agenda, of, you know, they talk about the levelling up agenda in the UK of distributing equity, distributing prosperity across the country. You know, the role of the station in supporting inclusive growth, in being able to demonstrate that it's not only a kind of a, a parameter of time and travel, but it's a parameter of social inclusion and growth and prosperity. What does that mean? It can mean many things and we don't have the time to do to talk about it today. But what effectively it talks about, you know, is, is broadening the, the, the offer of the needs of community and neighbourhood, that the station environment that, as I said earlier, is about accessibility, can actually provide as well. And we think that was a, you know, that, that, that in concert with being able to partner with people who provide the services creates a kind of different patina of the way in which the station can be seen, used, experienced. And, and taken forward. The third one was, and this is a pre-pandemic, you know, insightful kind of observation by, by Network Rail. They saw their role as, you know, as, as at the heart of a healthy community. 
and and health can be defined in many ways. You know, we have the the, the physicality of our environments. We have the 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 the, 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 the less kind of overt things of a, of acoustics and well-being and you know distraction to those with you know challenges like autism and the like. And so we 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 set you know they set the challenge of how do we understand the station at the heart of a healthy community. And I think one of the issues that came came clear was weaving all of this together was the role of the context in which the station sat, a network of station and public spaces that as we are digitally enabled and we can make choices, become a kind of a that 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 net into which the station operates, where footfall begins to aggregate and the experience of the users isn't at the threshold of a ticket barrier if when and if they still exist. But it's the experience when they decide to move and journey. And so the network of public spaces and particularly, you know, some of the other issues of the way in which we we address some of the other challenges of air quality and the like. So there were three things, centre of movement, supporting inclusive growth and the heart of healthy communities. The final thing I wanted to share with you very quickly is coming from the other other side of those, you know, who have to provide and are, are tasked to, to provide us with state-of-the-art rolling stock. We were asked by Mitsubishi to once again imagine a future station, roughly before we'd started this work. So some of you know some of the thinking has moved forward, but the you know the, the the challenge was we have these assets. Are we using them properly? Should we be thinking about other things? And there were two or three things that you know raised our mind. We 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 set out a series of eight or so key key objectives that we thought were the kind of the the, the direction. That the, the notion of the rolling stock as a contributor to the future station should be. But it was the one that I've kind of highlighted in the bottom right, creatively leveraging the assets of the railway and the station. You know, the station does have assets of the accessibility of kind of, of, of security, of, of, of kind of a contribution to the community that is of interest to others. And so that's where we began to develop the idea. In order to do that, we set it in a slightly different context we almost kind of zoomed in and out of scale, the station in its own right, the station in a, in a context, and the station in a network. You know, the, this kind of characteristics of the asset of the station in its wider infrastructure context. We effectively developed, as you saw in the previous slide, and I've just drawn it back, you know, there were 18 or so interesting projects or, or provocations of the way in which the station and the network could many could contribute. Just two or three that may be irrelevant here. Um, the network as, as a kind of a, a, a contributor to a diverse use of the station, and here we drew out modular train, um, if only we were kind of aware and being able to kind of imagine and watch the way in which the TGVs in France were repurposed as hospitals, you know, in their COVID context. You know, a health infrastructure moving around through a station, through a railway network, with a station repurposed in a different way. Um, we were interested in, in one way, in the space below the railway asset and the station, and where the geology and 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 the geotechnics is supported. Could there be kind of capturing of health and heat, or in 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 the case of Europe, the heat distributing it into surrounding communities? Assets of the kind of characteristics of this connectivity where the station is a pivot. Um, we looked at the context, you know, and there are many things about, you know, TODs and development and zones. I thought we thought one of the kind of key things was can we begin to articulate the investment zone, the kind of the mutual benefit, whether it is scale of development, of footfall, of, of common interest created by the, the magnetism. Of, of of people around the station, looking at the way in which that can be a kind of an economic outcome and benefit those who participate in that that zone of influence of the station in its context. And then finally, it was about the station itself. Um, many things that you know many of us you know try to think about and reimagine, but I guess it was it was going back to this notion: the station is third place. You know, not necessarily. You know the environment of of just the the you know, the movement, but those who kind of experience the coming together, the meeting. We see that in the wider precincts, and there's no doubt that that's a common principle. We do think, however, that there is an opportunity 
particularly when we look at some of the kind of business case of stations, to be able to deploy these type of uses much more embedded in the notion of the station. And so, you know, we, we with Mitsubishi, we were looking at the station in its immediacy, the station in its context, and the station in the wider network with these human experiences that aren't just about the journey, that are about the kind of the, the op opportunity of choice of life that comes with the uh, enablement that the station and the railway provided. Um, this is happening, you know, in many places. And it's, and it's, you know, delightful to kind of see the commitment, not only in, in, in guidance and policy, as we see in, in these two kind of critical pieces of, of guidance that we see in Victoria and New South Wales, um, but in institutional arrangements and the way in which organisations who are tasked with providing our, our, our railways and our stations, you know, are organising them in terms of outcomes of humans as that complement infrastructure. And so it's very important to acknowledge it. I think personally, you know, in Arab, we are we are kind of working our way through one of these opportunities as we see it in Martin Place and, and, and the way in which the station, the, the surroundings, the landscape, the development, the precinct, the operation is kind of in, is, is synthesized and being trying to, to explore and exploit the interrelationships of those, understanding, you know, the nuances of detail you know, challenges such as fire and footfall with the strategic issues that I've outlined today. So look, that's roughly where we think the future of station lies, looking at it through a steep networks, social, technological, economic environment and political parameters. I guess if there was one conclusion, we're seeing a kind of increase in the social outcome of our stations and the way in which they can contribute, whether directly or indirectly into the precincts. Um, Manifesting that through the principles and the tactics that I spoke about earlier, you know, the way in which stations are kind of increasingly synthesized and camouflaged into our environments, whether they be, you know, the urban or even the non-urban, you know, we think they have a contribution to make. Um, I guess seeing it through the eyes of the operator, in this case of network rail, you know, movement, that notion of inclusive growth and the notion of at the heart of healthy communities. You know, starting points or at least guiding lights in the discussion of what is the future station and what is its outcomes that deliver a, a kind of convenient and exciting and enjoyable and safe uh, movement and journey experience. And then finally, as we just, you know, just finished saying the, you know, the role of the rolling stock, you know, as this kind of an enabler that can change uses, that can make new relationships, that can kind of facilitate uh, a new way of experiencing, using and valuing our stations, we think is a critical thing. So those three things come together. You know, what were those thoughts? How does the operator see it? How does, the, how, does the, um, how does someone who provides us with rolling stock might see the future of the station? But it brings us back to the question, you know, one does not travel but to arrive, but to journey. And so who is journeying and experiencing the stations as a critical part along that journey, you know, continues to diversify. And I think if we're going to be able to imagine that future station, imagine that future user um, today, tomorrow, the diversity that is coming, hopefully some of those observations that we've made, some of the provocations that ask the questions, and many of those remain unanswered as we continue to kind of explore it certainly for us asks and sets the direction as we embark on that period of blank piece of paper what is the future of the station work that we've been asked to do they're the questions that we do so simon thanks very much that's a little story and maybe there's a few questions that might have come from those listening in thanks thanks so much malcolm it was a fascinating presentation and really exciting to think about what the future of stations could look like both here in australia and, and globally so um just a reminder to everyone on the line you can still submit your questions um through the questions pane in the uh attendee control panel on the right so please feel free to jump on there and and put a question to malcolm and um, we do have a couple to start off with so we'll, we'll get straight into those if you don't mind malcolm terrific, so terrific. um we've got one uh, from someone in brisbane noting that you know most stations in a network are, um are not intercity stations which seem to mm. be 
a number of your examples. So the question is, is the future of stations the same for suburban stations and just scale down or is it a different sort of approach, do you think? Yeah, no, look, it's a great, it's very easy to do the kind of the heroic stations, isn't it? And kind of, you know, you know, lots of urban development and all of that. And I, I, I you know, if I'd had a bit more time, particularly in the Mitsubishi work, I could have shown the way in which we categorised, you know, stations through a hierarchy of four systems where the big, you know, inner city urban ones, were, you know, were only one. Um, you're right. It's a good question. And I think, you know, if, if you want to, if you want to see a kind of an interesting view of the, of, of, of the future, I would take us to look at SNCF and ProRail, so the French and the Dutch. Um, so it's very interesting to see the way in which they began to understand the experience of, 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 of often suburban or even, you know, country stations, you know, places to dwell, places to wait, places to kind of come together. Um, it was interesting, ProRail, you know, and, and, um, and the Dutch, looking at the way in which uh, facilities, localised producers of um, you know, produce providers or, you know, or, or, or other, other providers local to communities are given space inside, in, inside very small stations. And so they are recognising that the station kind of contributes to a very localised community. And I think that's the way in which we we kind of need to, uh, to 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 think about it in another way. But it goes back to the, I think to the to the question that is constant whether it's a kind of an in, in inner city, you know, urban condition and through the whole hierarchy out to a rural condition. What are the what are the assets of the station that can be kind of repurposed without you know getting in the way of issues of or, or any way. Uh, creating issues of security and things, all critical things when we're dealing with these type of things. You know, issues of, you know, the provision of services, the provision of covered space, the provision of lighting, you know, the provision of parking. All of these things are, are relatively redeployable into other uses. And so, you know, taking that that kind of redeployment of the assets of the station as we did as core, one of the core questions of the Mitsubishi work and asking in a particular context, what could we do, um, you know, was where we were at. And then it was complemented by, you know, some of that ideas of maybe the rolling stock could become, you know, diversified. Is this the, is this the frontier for a kind of a, you know, a traveling theater, a traveling healthcare, um, traveling education, moving education, um, other types of kind of physical conditions that aren't required all the time in more more non-urban conditions that the station could contribute. So yes, a, a really good question. But you know, the the I think the answer lies in can we repurpose, not repurpose, or certainly leverage the assets of those scales of station. Yeah, great. And and that uh, kind of leads into another question we had around. Um, what sort of elements of this design do you see being really being able to be integrated into those existing stations um, as opposed to um, looking at you know a greenfield site and but I think you've kind of covered off how yeah a little I hope, I hope yeah hopefully hopefully Simon that did cover it and 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 I think that that's why it was really important to kind of share with you some of the thinking of the role of the rolling stock as a kind of a tool a device that could diversify and enrich the way in which we use the stations. So, um, but you know, at the end of the day also, I would just say, you know, that the, uh, while many of the things I've shared today will, should and possibly unashamedly feel fairly high level, you know, the devil is in the detail of some of the technical challenge, whether it's a historically listed station, issues of fire and materiality or safety and all of those things. So it's kind of got to be a, you know, we've got to tackle it from both sides, particularly in an existing, you know, asset. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, we've just had another one come through. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll just read it out. So have you seen the electrification of bus fleets change the design of stations, given the ability to integrate more fully with the station environment? Um, I, 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 I can't say I have. That doesn't mean it, it, it's not happening. Um, I think I think the issue where I saw more uh, fundamental, uh, and I think the reason for that is I'll, I'll I'll kind of declare it. I don't think I see, I've you know from my time you know 
overseas as much of the electrification of the of, of, of the bus services as as maybe as I'm, I'm starting to learn in 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 the asian australasian context um but i do think you know where that integration happens is some of the stories of those arrival spaces that people experience in the and the way in which the the mode systems come up to and use public realm as the territory of interchange you know i think too often we've had there's the bus station there's the bikes there's the taxis there's that and i think we're increasingly able to for a variety of technical advancements be able to kind of aggregate that and we certainly see that if you want to see an example of that have a look at the um the zud station in amsterdam the southern amsterdam area where the the two big pieces of public realm either side of the station you literally come out of the station and you're into a park or you're into the square this 40,000 car um 40,000 car parking bicycle parking spaces below you know the tram system and is and metro systems are kind of weaving themselves through each other you know that that's where i started to see the synthesis i assume that and it's very reasonable to think you know the electrification electrification of buses contributes to that as well sure um another one that uh i've been thinking about is has there been, I mean, obviously as a result of the pandemic, we've seen a lot of um, social distancing measures come into place, particularly at a number of stations here in Australia. Are you, are you seeing any long-term implications for the design of stations coming out of the issues we've been dealing with through the pandemic? Um, so, I mean, I think the thing that we are starting to see is, is uh, you know, at the end of the day, there, it's about kind of, controlling flows it's a, it's a it's a flow issue but it's also an issue of where aggregation happens you know where do people gather you know we could we could have a look at an image from the 1850s of people looking up at a signboard in a station you know all next to each other because that was the point of information we are now liberated from that and so people can almost self police where they wait in what density relative to how they get there. And therefore, the, to go back to your question, that's the point I, we were making about, you know, uh, uh, contribution to a healthy community. I think it's the context, often the public realms, the gathering spaces beyond, because we are liberated from, you know, a, a, a flickering notice board above there and walk to platform four, that we can make a choice and we can be further away and distributed. I think we're starting to see that a lot more. And I think, you know, and the reason why that I think is not only a COVID issue, it's a value issue, it's an urban issue, it's a kind of accessibility issue. People who take longer to 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 move towards stations can be making their own choices. Those who can stand back and stay back and make choices in a different way, I think we will see. So not possible, certainly in some of the kind of you know issues of materiality and those things inside the stations absolute but in the more structural ideas i think it's the context and the gathering spaces around them yeah sure no thank you for that and um one of the things that struck me through the presentation is that there's you know obviously a, a really increased focus on uh, on the passenger journey and the customer experience mm. in terms of being in a, a station and not just you know rocking up rocking up to jump on a train and that's certainly the approach I've seen in the past in the airport space, where they've very much gone from a place to, you know, it's just somewhere you turn up and jump on a plane to try and make it a much more experiential type of, um, of journey. And, and I guess one of the ways that I know that's been done in the aviation space was a, a, a much heavier reliance on sort of data analytics and trying to understand how people move through an airport where you get increased dwell times, how you can kind of enhance experience. Are you seeing that sort of similar approach being taken to to stations globally from a train perspective and rail perspective? Oh, 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 to totally. Uh, and, and I think, you know, this is driven out of the opportunity of, you know, the core component of station, you know, where people are kind of coming to common points of movement, but also the need to kind of, you know, make the asset work harder financially and in, in, in those terms. You know, it's 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 a it's a little bit old now and I but it's still a very powerful example. Well, there's two examples. One is when you look at um, what they did in St Pancras in London, where you had the old station and they took out two of the platforms where the high-speed line came in and there's retail down in there. You are now, because of that kind of 
you know, accessibility that you get to the station, you will sometimes get more people going to those shopping environments than you will to the station, but they are cheek by jowl. And so, you know, understanding then when you start to get that type of usage, the way in which that type of footfall is either complementing or competing against each other is almost the challenge that we now have. It's fine to talk about diversifying. It's time, fine to talk about all the things that I've mentioned before. But you've equally got to be very careful that these things don't then fight against each other because of, of, of different expectations of the ability to move. You know, if I'm late for a train to get to X and I've got my head down, that's very different to someone kind of meandering through an environment or picking up some, you know, some some laundry or something like that. So, you know, we're, I guess we're equally interested in being able to understand not only the kind of the, the quantified you know, data of, 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 of movement systems, but, you know, understanding the way in which actual users, you, you know, behave beyond the kind of the, the generalization of, our, of, of much of our pedestrian modeling systems. So activity-based modeling is something that we're investing a lot of energy in to, to be able to demonstrate those things. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, another one that's been around um, the kind of design principles and approaches you've outlined in, in your presentation, are you seeing them being considered in any projects here in Australia? I think you mentioned you're doing some work around the Martin Place. Um, yeah, I, well, I, look, I, I think we do, and I think we do, and this is where there's a kind of a, you know, a, a terrific call out to, and the reason why I included some of the guidance and policy documents, and 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 complementing that is the way in which those who are kind of tasked with procuring it, you know, um, are, are organising themselves. And so I, I think we're starting to see that, you know, in the Australasian context, um, maybe more so because you have to remember that, you know, in, in many other contexts, much, a lot of infrastructure is built. Here we are, you know, in, in, in this context, building some of this. And so to see those policy guiding us, I think, I think we do start to see it. I think we see it in a slightly more accelerated way in the likes of, of Singapore, you know, and now they have the, the pressure of, you know, compaction and land and all of that. And that might be kind of generating a, a more rapid deployment of those things of re, you, how do they, how do the station environments contribute? What is the experience inside? How do they work across the day? All of that type of stuff. But I, I, I think we are certainly starting to see it. Um, and it's not just the stations. That's the great thing. The station is a kind of a, is, is, is a fluxing boundary, as we see in, in, in the guidelines. And, and so we're starting to see it in, in numerous places. You know, Martin Place is a very interesting kind of, you know, stacked complexity. And as the first question kind of said, in my, my, maybe one way, it's the kind of heroic illustration of, these, of this system. But, you know, maybe it's looking at, you know, some of the projects in the more kind of the edge of city station conditions that we should come back and ask ourselves the question, what is the future of the station of the non-urban station? And maybe focus on that, because I think that's where we are seeing some of that as we see this kind of movement of people, you know, to, to, to different lifestyles. And it's, it, we're going to see our stations used in a different way. So certainly seeing it coming, coming through. Yeah, fantastic. Um, we are running short of time, but I'll just go with one more question, a little bit of a left field one. Um, in terms of the design and approach for, for future stations, are you seeing um, security being considered at all in that design concept? And I think it's probably just a bit of an allusion to, you know, obviously what we've seen happen in the aviation space over the last 20 years, and that's obviously a slightly different sort of threat environment, but are there any of those sort of um, behavioural monitoring or, or security elements being considered in the design of, of future stations? Yeah, well, uh, Simon, I'm sure, you know, you, you know I'm going to say yes, because, <laughs> you know, the vulnerability, you know, the new the new vulnerabilities that we experience around our stations is, you know, is 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 continually changing. You know, and you know, those those who choose to make our try to make our our stations less secure uh, uh, are creative and 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 ever changing. So, but that being said, you know, there are new tools. You know, we could have spoken about the way in which 
uh, you know, the, the ability to, to, to use AI systems to monitor abnormal behavior without personalizing data is something that's very interesting. And we're, we're watching that, you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly interesting to watch, you know, those working in AI monitoring and the ability to kind of distinguish abnormality. And so that, you know, to be able to kind of trigger you know, points of vulnerability. That's a kind of a monitoring, you know, interpretation of security, the physicality of security. Um, I think, you know, they're once again, they're kind of what is the boundary of control? It's it's um it's a sad reality. We need to be able to defend our station environments from, you know, physical intrusion and bollarding and things like that. But the question is, as we begin to be able to kind of change the use of, that's why I included, change the use of the of the of the of the surface around our stations. Are we able to kind of ask where is the threshold of security? And we're certainly looking at some of those um, challenges and questions to to as we look at you know new stations in in various places. But it's an ever changing thing, and so we always have to be kind of astute to that notion of the adaptability to be able to kind of quickly adjust how we deploy security. Fantastic. Look, I'm conscious of time, so we might have to leave it there. So look, thank you again, Malcolm, for your time today. It was a fantastic presentation. Uh, I found it really insightful myself and hopefully everyone on the line enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and thank you again to those who, who've joined us today and, and for engaging in that little Q&A session at the end. Um, we will be doing a, a short feedback uh, survey following this webinar, so I'd encourage you all to, to fill that in and, and get that back to us. Um, we do have some other webinars sh uh, scheduled over the coming weeks on a variety of different topics, but our next one uh, is scheduled for the 2nd of June, which is um, titled Beyond 2020, Sustaining the Future of Asset Management. So um, that'll be presented by Dr. Monique Beadles as an internationally recognised thought leader in asset management and the author of Asset Management for Directors. So I'd encourage you all to jump on the ARA website and register for that one. So look, once again, thanks to Frauscher for sponsoring our ARA webinar series and a, and a big thank you to you, Malcolm, for, for joining us here today. Um, so thank you again for everyone on the line. Have a lovely afternoon. Uh, stay safe and we'll see you at the next one. See you later.